Welcome to Peace Now. My name is Trudy Quaife. I'm a member of Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. We're a local organization of friends and neighbors. We've been advocating for peace and justice for the past decade. I'm your host today, and I'm joined by Paul Rehm. Thank you for being here, Paul. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Let me tell you a little bit about Paul. He's a graduate of Siena College. He's a member of the Albany Friends Meeting. He's an activist, and he's a reservist with Christian peacemaker teams, and much more. That's just a sampling. I'm so glad you're here today. I would like to start uh, with talking a little bit about your background. I wondered if you could tell us why you decided to become an activist, if it was one particular thing, and how long have you been an activist? The short one is uh, the last portion of that question, and I would say probably about uh, 15, 16 years, something like that. And it was almost a 180 degree turn because I was raised uh, about 25 miles southwest of here in a, uh, in a conservative community, a product of the public education system, um, believing that this was the greatest country in the world and that um, being able to fight for your country was one of the uh, greatest callings that one could answer. Mm -hmm. And in, in this community, I think that's probably still, still the case. So I was going through high school and, and absorbing the history uh, that was being taught and mostly American history around wars and calculating the, di the time between wars and hoping that my age would be such after I got out of school that I wouldn't miss a war. Uh, it's, it's strange looking back on it from this perspective. I was a Goldwater conservative and uh, knocked on doors for Barry Goldwater. Shortly after, that would have been 1964, 1965, I tried to get a scholarship to go to a two-week school out in Colorado called the Freedom School. Didn't get the scholarship, but went anyway and it was a Socratic type forum instruction, enlightening, and it was there that I first realized, despite my Sunday school and church um, background, that it wasn't right to kill anybody, that I had no right to kill anyone else, no one had a right to kill me. That was maybe the first change, but I just sat with that. Nothing much happened beyond that until shortly after um, my wife and I got married. We've, she's from Germany, and oh, a year or two after she arrived in this country, we received a, a mailing from Time and Space Limited, which is a facility in Hudson, Two great women, uh, Linda and Claudia, bought this old warehouse in Hudson and they fixed it up, made a, a community center, a performance space, um, an area for doing work with children in Hudson. It's just a great space and two great ladies and they were bringing Dan Berrigan and Liz McAllister to Hudson. And I told my wife that this is, you know, you're in America now, for better or for worse, and this is an opportunity to hear somebody who's really a, a crucial part of America's history. So we went to hear Dan and Liz Berrigan, uh, Liz McAllister, Dan Berrigan, Liz McAllister. Liz was Phil Berrigan's wife, and Dan recited some of his poetry, Liz spoke, and then they got into a question and answer session with those of us in the audience. And Dan's 
living what he saw as Christ's call was so moving that maybe that was the spark that touched mm -hmm. all the kindling that had been lying there mm -hmm. before. That led to uh, more exploration around the life of Jesus and around his teaching through retreats with Dan at uh, Kirkridge in Pennsylvania, at the Pyramid Life Center up in the Adirondacks. Um, Jesus became <laughs> more a person as opposed to that pretty picture we had in the Sunday school of this fair-haired man with little children around him. Uh, realizing, of course, that he, in that Palestinian area where he grew up, he would not have been a fair-skinned, fair-skinned, blonde individual. He would have been dark-skinned, dark hair. And living among the uh, poor folks in the population and living under Roman oppression, occupation, so that the faith portion of it started to come alive there. And we went following um, Dan and Liz's presentation in Hudson. We went to New York where Kathy Kelly, the founder of Voices in the Wilderness and now who heads up Voices for Creative Nonviolence, is being awarded the Pfeiffer Peace Prize. And she, she is an inspiration as well. Anybody she who's is. ever heard her knows she that she is, is an I've inspiration. Heard her several times. Uh, yeah. And that really got got things underway from there. With Fellowship of Reconciliation, um, the Atlantic Life Community, which is a faith and resistance community that grew out of um, Jonah House, a Catholic worker house in Baltimore where Phil Berrigan and Liz McAllister lived, raised their family, and had a Catholic worker community. So that's, that's, okay. that's where it started, how it started. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about some of the issues that you're concerned about now. I know you've traveled to Israel and Palestine several times. In fact, I think you lived there for a while, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how you define lived. Um, this journey that I have been on, and I left off mentioning Fellowship of Reconciliation and uh, Jonah House, Anne Montgomery, who is a uh, woman religious, was involved with, with Jonah House, with the Atlantic Life community, with the Kairos community in New York, with Fellowship of Reconciliation. And she was a member of Christian Peacemaker teams. We heard her make a presentation at a Fellowship of Reconciliation International Gathering that awakened uh, interest on our part. And we thought, here's an opportunity possibly to put some of Christ's teachings to work we learned more about Christian Peacemaker teams. Katya and I went to Kenora uh, in Canada on a delegation. This was an area where First Nations people were in conflict with the uh, logging companies that were clear-cutting on the land up there. So we went on a delegation to see what, what was happening there, but more to find out about, and I'll use CPT because it's shorter than saying Christian Peacemaker Teams all the time, to see what CPT was really all about. And it was a good eye-opening experience. We flew into Winnipeg, spent the first night at a, at a community house there, and there was a, I digress just a little bit, there was a neat sign over the sink in this house and it said, everybody wants a revolution, but nobody wants to do the dishes. And I, 
I thought that was a good reminder of uh, all the roles that are involved in any kind of human rights activity. Mm -hmm. So we, we uh, spent about two weeks with CPT in Canada, came back, I decided I did want to pursue it, took uh, a month's training with CPT at their headquarters in Chicago, and at the end of that period was, was given a choice. CPT has teams, um, violence reduction teams, accompaniment teams in various places around the world. Right now we have a team in Colombia, we have a team in Iraq, we've had a team in Palestine since 1996, um, we've had teams on the U.S.-Mexican border, uh, in Haiti, inner city experiences. So at the end of the four weeks, I was given a choice, where would I like to work? And my first choice was on the U.S.-Mexican border, and the second choice was Israel-Palestine. And that, um, part of the reason for that, we had gone <laughs> on a, a delegation to Israel-Palestine, my wife and I, with Every Church a Peace Church awakened our eyes to the situation there. We had no real idea. We were confused. What's East Bank? What's West Bank? East Jerusalem? West Jerusalem? Green Line? All the terms that are thrown around. And so we went on this delegation, got a chance to travel in the Holy Land, which was amazing, and got to meet a lot of both Israeli and Palestinian human rights activists working for peace uh, nonviolently. And, and then on the way out from Ramallah, we passed through the Kalandia checkpoint and saw Palestinians crowded into a narrow area like cattle into a car, and it just, it just turned our stomachs. So we had this, this tiny background with Israel-Palestine, so that was my second choice. Um, folks at CPT decided that should be my first choice because that's where people were more needed. And I've been now six times with CPT over the past eight years. And for five, six, seven weeks each time. And did I, did I live there? We, we live when we're there. Uh, CPT has an apartment, primitive apartment in the old city, and we live in, in community. We take turns. Um, and there's a list on the bulletin board, and today is your day to cook the evening meal, and tomorrow is your day to do the cleaning, and the next day is your day to lead worship, and and so it goes, so that everybody is involved in the daily tasks of keeping the apartment up in addition to uh, our work there, which is primarily accompaniment. Um, getting in the way was uh, an early slogan motto of CPT, and that was a double entendre, getting in the way between people in conflict in the hope of reducing the tension and getting in the way that we see Jesus having taught. Could, could you talk a little bit about what you saw there? What are the conditions like? <laughs> the conditions are in the old city, a city under people under occupation. And we are out on and off throughout the day in the old city. We're at the checkpoints. The children have to go through checkpoints on the way to school every morning, on the way back home again. So we monitor the checkpoints. Um, the feeling is that the Israeli soldiers are less likely to be abusive to the children if there are international eyes watching. And so we're 
international eyes watching and reporting back, talking with people about back home about what we've seen, what the occupation looks like, what it's what it's like to from our perspective, what it's like to live under occupation. We have the uh, say, uh, benefit of a, an international passport. CPT is comprised of Americans, Canadians, Europeans, Eurasians, a broad mix of people, but with the international passports that although we wind up being harassed uh, or arrested or pushed around, um, we know we can go back home again. Mm -hmm. So this is, our view of the occupation is a little different. The Palestinians are home and living under the occupation. So you've got kids going through the checkpoints and their book bags being rifled through by the Israeli soldiers. You've got Israeli children throwing stones at Palestinian children, which is one of the saddest things you see because you wonder how, how can parents <laughs> imbue this feeling of, of hatred in their, in their children. It, it's really sad. We're also, we're also out um, watching the activities of, watching my own activities here. Let's see if this works. I hope it still works. I'm, Looking in the other room, and I don't see anybody screaming and yelling, it, yeah, so it's okay. It Good. <laughs> um, walking the streets, the Israeli soldiers are often out on patrol, and so we tag along on a patrol and watch what they're doing. Again, the thought being that there's, they're less likely to be as abusive as they might be if somebody's watching. Um, what do you think can be done about this? Uh, do you have any ideas of what we might be able to do about this other than just observe? Well, um, we do, <laughs> yeah, you could take CPT training <laughs> and uh -huh. come and join us in Palestine. Uh -huh. um, while we're there, we try to get in the way. We try to engage people in dialogue. We try to reach the, the, the uh -huh. settlers. Hebron is one of the, uh -huh. one of the areas where there are settlements in the city, most portions of the West Bank where there are settlements, they're up on a hill someplace. Um, the settlers in Hebron are in the, in the city itself, in the old city, and they tend to be more aggressive than most, than many groups of settlers. So we're, we're trying to keep things calm there. We again come back and share. So I would say educating yourself. Um, learning more about the situation. We've met with our representatives. We've written letters to our representatives in Congress. Uh, we've demonstrated, uh, we've done all the, the normal things that one uh, associates with human rights activism. The other thing, uh, and this comes along with um, the education aspect of it, you can invite a CPT or somebody who's knowledgeable to come and make a presentation to your group. But making things change on the ground and coming up someday with peace and justice, equal justice for Palestinians and Israelis, is going to take a lot of effort and I think part of that is the call that has come from Palestinian civil society for boycotts, divestments, and sanctions. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the groups that Katja and I work with locally, Palestinian Rights Committee of Upper Hudson Peace Action, down the river a little bit, Middle East Crisis Response in Woodstock. Uh, nationally, the U.S. campaign to end the occupation these organizations all feel that if we can put pressure on the pocketbooks of the Israeli government, that maybe we can move away from the oppression, away from the occupation. It worked in apartheid South Africa. There are products that are being produced in the settlements. Um, first, 
First thing, under international law, it's illegal for an occupying power to move its population into the territory that it occupies. And this is what the Israeli government is doing. They're moving their population. There are around 500,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank. It's illegal again under international law to to profit from the occupation. And there are these enterprises in the settlements that profit from the occupation. Um, mm -hmm. We said, don't buy Ahava cosmetics. They're produced in a settlement. Mm -hmm. um, don't buy soda stream carbonation units. They're produced in a settlement. In, settle, in a settlement. Um, if you own stock in Caterpillar that provides bulldozers to destroy Palestinian homes, sell your Caterpillar stock. I, Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we're we're rapidly running out of time here, so I'm wondering if we can move on to another really important topic that you're working on. Uh, so if we could shift gears a little bit, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Guantanamo Bay prison. I know that's another issue that you've been very involved in. And I wondered if you could tell people why uh, why should Americans want that prison closed. What, what's going on there now, and why should we want it closed? Guantanamo was opened, it will be 12 years ago this January 11th, and originally there were some 700 odd men brought to Guantanamo uh, without charge, imprisoned there, and if you remember, Dick Cheney said they were the worst of the worst, and uh, they're down to about 154 now, and all the rest have been uh, released from Guantanamo. Eighty, I think about 84 of the men who are still being detained there have been cleared for release, have not been released, have not been charged with anything. This is, you know, we... <laughs> as a nation have become what we once said we abhorred when the when the Soviet Union was uh, I think I need some of the duct tape <laughs> 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 where the Soviet Union was sending people to uh, gulags and uh, the communist Chinese we're sending people away uh, and no trials and just imprisoning them. And we're doing the same thing. These men have not been tried with anything. We've become, as a nation, what we once abhorred. It's, it's a recruiting ground for terrorists. People who are opposed to America and its policies only have to say, you know, you guys preach fairness, you preach justice, you preach the rule of law, you make all these high-sounding words. And look what you're doing in Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. you, you're imprisoning people without trial. You're clearing them for release, but you're not releasing them. You've got men, I think they're either 14 or 15, depending on which report you're listening to. They're men who've been on hunger strike, who are being force-fed twice a day, who are having tubes shoved up their nostrils, down their throats, and being fed in a very painful fashion. Uh, one of Obama's first promises when he took office the first time around was that he was going to close Guantanamo. Uh, it's still open. There are men still being held there. It's the second time around. He's he said back in May that he was appointing someone new to uh, oversee the, the closure and the transfer of these prisoners. And right after making that pronouncement, uh, shortly thereafter, there were two men released. That was back in May. This is November. And it does seem like it uh, was a nice PR move, but there are men who have no hope and I don't, I don't see how Americans can put up with this. This is our country, our government doing this. 
why aren't more people involved? There's a demonstration in Washington every year around the 11th of January. Come on down. <laughs> Join Witness Against Torture and, and the Center for Constitutional Rights, the ACLU, Amnesty International, the Torture and Abolition Survivors and Support Coalition, all the folks who do come down there. Write letters to the editor. Visit your Congress people. Demand that they restore some little bit of what was America's honor and America's stature. Uh, it needs to be done. Um, I know that you've been really involved in various different uh, actions against um, against this prison. I know you've gone to Washington. Uh, I know I've seen you protesting um, around the capital region. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? I, I know sometimes you you dress as um, as the prisoners dress at Guantanamo Bay and um, yeah, the normal. <laughs> attire, if you will, for many of us is the same orange jumpsuit, jumpsuit and black hood that the, uh, the prisoners were forced to wear. We'll don that in protest here, in the protest march that takes place in Washington every year. We're part of that procession. I've been arrested in front of the White House wearing that jumpsuit and black hood. The group of people from Witness Against Torture now who are involved in a in a rolling fast in in support of the 1415 guys on Guantanamo who've been on a they're on a hunger strike every day. Mm -hmm. So they're a group a group who take turns picking one day a month. And they're uh, still being still and being doing forced it fast and that's still going on. I mean it's nothing at all like what's happening in Guantanamo. It's not like um, Elliot Adams was doing here or Tara mm -hmm. Kauf uh, when they were doing the prolonged period of uh, liquid-only fasts where they both lost a substantial amount of weight mm -hmm. and um, it affected their health. But it's something that we can do in solidarity. It's something that anyone can do in solidarity. And initially I said, well, you don't have to fast. You can work, you can do all this, but it is, I found, it is amazing what something as small as a one-day fast can do to focus your mind and your thinking um, on these men and on Guantanamo and I don't know how you'd say you're, you're diminishing your intake of nourishment, but you're charging your battery at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something else somebody, anyone can do. And there are websites um, we provided. Learn more, if you can, about Israel-Palestine, about Guantanamo. Um, yeah. Well, these are two really, really enormously important topics that we've talked about here today, and I so appreciate your being here today. Um, this is difficult stuff, and um, your activism is really appreciated. I know there are several organizations that you work with. We're down to our final minute here, so I wondered okay. if you wanted to just name a couple of the organizations that you feel are doing exceptionally good work that you'd like people to know about in case they're interested in working with us. Yeah, <coughs> in, the, in this area, or I guess this goes up to Burlington, Vermont, so in New York State, let me say that two organizations that we work with, one in, in the Capital District is the Palestinian Rights Committee of Upper Hudson Peace Action. So either one of those, if you Google one or the other, Palestinian Rights Committee or Upper Hudson Peace Action, those are two good local for us sites. Uh, the group in Woodstock called Middle East Crisis Response. If you check mideastcrisis.org, find more information about them. On a national level, the U.S. campaign to end the occupation, just Google U.S. campaign to end the occupation, you'll find it's, it's an umbrella organization of all the regional organizations around the country working to end the occupation. Okay. As far as Guantanamo is concerned, uh, Witness Against Torture, um, 
Center for Constitutional Rights, Torture and Abolition Survivors Support Coalition. You had one you mentioned about uh, closeguantanamo.com.net. Dot dot net. Dot net. Sorry. Yes. Uh, All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it at that. So thank you very much for joining me here today, Paul. Thank it's you. It's a real pleasure. I hope you'll come thank back you. again. We have a lot more to talk about, and I hope you all will join us for future shows. Thank you. Thank you. Bring them home, bring them home, bring our parents, our children home from the dust of Of Baghdad back to our arms, bring 